Welcome to the Loopy Pro video manual. This is a series of videos getting you up and running as quickly as possible with Loopy Pro. In this video, we're gonna be talking about two things, recording your session so you have a song at the end of it and the sequencer. Now I've brought up one of my sessions here, which looks a little bit confusing, but I'm gonna step you through what it's doing. Each color of loops are grouped together. So I can either play the first, second, or third of each color. So as I play one, the other one stops. We have eight loops and three versions of that loop. Underneath that, we have two things. On the right hand side, we have samples. So I can play the sample straight away. And on the left hand side, we have the gray clip slicer. And that is dedicated to the red loops, which are my drums. They're also set to transients, so I can pick out things like the kick and the snare. At the bottom, I've got quite a few things going on, including effects like reverb, FAC transient, and we also have an AUV3 plugin, which is House Mark 1. Now, in the previous video, we talked about MIDI and how you can play something like a MIDI keyboard, like the one I've got here, to use it to control things like synthesizers and keyboards. So I've done that with House Mark 1, and I've got all the loops that I want. I want to record my session, everything that's been done with the loops, everything that's been done with the samples, the order that I've done them in, and actually create a live song. So there's two ways we can do this, and the first way is actually the record button on the top right hand corner. When you click this you have two options, record the audio and this will record everything from the loops, everything that's in the mixer and any audio that's coming in to Loopy Pro including things like your microphone, guitar, whatever you're playing or singing live. Now when you do this and then do record audio it's asking you what's the configuration. This is really powerful and clever because you might want to put this out to somewhere else like another digital audio workstation to then send to someone who's going to mix and master it later on but the default is combined input and output and that's everything, everything that's going on in Loopy Pro. You can also do lossless recording. And depending on how you have Loopy Pro set up, if you go into the settings and we go into the system settings, you can actually see how you've got Loopy Pro for sample rate. Now I've got this set at 48 kilohertz and it was done at 32 bit. So for now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna hit record and hit start recording and it's a combined input and output. When you hit record, the record button goes red and it's actually recording me right now. It's recording what I'm actually saying because the microphone's live as well. It'll record everything we do, so if we press play. And you can see that the recording is starting around there now. Now, if I was to play loops, I was to sing, I was to trigger things, everything, I play a MIDI keyboard, it would capture all of that and make it a recording. When I hit stop, it stopped recording. And it's as simple as that. So the question is, where is that recording? Where's it gone? So for this, what we need to do is go up to the top left-hand corner, the little folder icon. And you can see here, we've got JP set two and the save points I've done. And you can actually see at the bottom here, it says recordings. And there it is, there's today's recording. It shows you the duration. It shows you how many megabytes it is. And we can go into it and we can see it, we can play it. So if I hit play, you'll hear what I've just said. When you hit record, the record button goes red. And it's actually recording me right now. It's recording what I'm actually saying because the microphone's live as well. So then you can hear the whole recording. We can click share and we can share this out to whatever you want to do. You can save the media, copy the audio. You could share it to somewhere else, maybe save it in files or send it out to a digital audio workstation. The second way you can record is actually record a sequence. And with this, there are two different ways. One, I can just play what I'm doing and record a live sequence right now, or I can go into the sequencer and manually apply it there. The easiest way is just to hit start recording. It'll record the sequence. Now the difference with this is that it'll record what is being looped. Cause it says right there, record session actions to the sequencer. So in this scenario, nothing's changed except this isn't really going to record anything that you've done live. So for example, the microphone, guitar, anything I'm going to play right in the moment, it won't record this. We're just recording the sequence of loops. So if I hit record, it's going to start. Let's add some things in.
Now when I press stop on the session, you can see that the record has stopped. And what we've now got is we've got stuff in the sequencer. The way we can tell that is there's a tiny little dot on the sequencer button. So let's go into it now. So as you can see, it's recorded things that we've put in and we've got all these different parts. So this is where you have to look at what you've got. So if I look at here, we've actually got two reds, two oranges, two yellows, one light green, two dark greens, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see how many loops you've actually got with some audio in. So if we go back to there, you can see I've got two reds and you can see that it's flipping and changing between the two. I've got two oranges and it's changed at that point. If I move across, this is like a timeline and you can see that it's gone across there and we've ended with that loop there. If you're familiar with any digital audio workstation and you're looking at it from a tracks point of view where you're looking at it linearly, then this should make a lot of sense. Then if you scroll down, you can actually see we've got the samples and they're in pink and I've only got two, but it's actually got eight samples, eight clips of samples. And as we scroll through and have a look, we can move across and actually see where we put these samples in. The other thing you'll see at the top is how many bars and beats it is. So you can start with one and goes up in numerical order and we can use pinch and actually pinch this to make it smaller. So we can see the entire length of the track. Now we've got it sequenced, you can see at the top, it actually says SEQ next door to the play button. So if I go back to the loops, I can actually turn this on or off. So we've got a sequence and that's fine, but if I now hit play and just turn these on, these are not being played to the sequencer. However, if I go to sequence, you can see that they turned off. And if I hit play, they're gonna add in in the order that they are sequenced. So they're gonna follow this. So if I zoom this across to over here, and we go back to here, you can see it's following that, it's copying that pattern. Now why does sequence exist? The whole point of it is so you can then maybe hit record. Now you wanna record the audio. You don't have to control the loops. It's already sequenced. You hit record, you could play over the top, sing over the top, and then you've got your sequence loops in time the way you want them, and then you can make a performance on top of that. So by pressing the sequencer button, whether it's white, it's following the sequence, or if it's black, it's not following the sequence, this will make a huge change depending on what you want to do with this song. But the sequencer is so much more than just following the pattern of what you've recorded. The alternative thing you can do is you can actually draw this in. So if I want to add things in, I can do, I can just tap, and I can add in parts to that sequence. Or if I tap on a part that I have sequenced, I can say copy this or delete it. Or if it's slightly out of time, I can quantize it. So let's have a look at this one here and we can see where it is. Let's quantize it and you can see it just shifted slightly. So it is in time. Now, if I wanted to record something in one of the loops that I've still got, these are the ones that are here. So we've actually got clips 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, and 24. These are the eight loops that I've not recorded anything on. So the bottom row of the colors, as you can see here. If I was to tap on the sequencer and click it, you can now see on the yellow one, it says arm, and I can arm the recording. So while it's playing along, I could record into this loop, and we can obviously make that a lot bigger by dragging it out. And you can do that with any loop. Once you've clicked it, there's these little handles at the end, and we can drag and change the size of any sequenced recording by just using these handles at the end. I can move it across, it's completely non-destructive. But because there is no loop in this yellow one, you can see arm there, and if I turn arm recording on, it's asking me how many bars is this loop length? So this one is 16, but if we move that across, we can actually say, well, it's gonna be two bars long, and you can see there it started to repeat it. So the little indentations it's now created means that's a two bar loop. If we go back to arm and let's just change this over to four bars, you can see there there's only three indentations making four loops. I hope that makes sense to you. So as the sequence is going along, I could record a loop in the sequence and it would be added into the sequence and also added in as a loop here. It's just an alternative way to create a loop whilst you're in the sequencer. If I delete this, you can see arm goes away from that clip. One thing I need to let you know about arm recording when you put the selection at the very beginning of the track. So you can see on the green one here, I've actually put this selection right at the very, very beginning. When we click arm and we turn it on, you're presented with a couple more options. It needs to know whether you need a count in, whether you want to start immediately. And then the other thing as well is whether you want it to detect the loop. So start recording immediately, automatically detect the start and end of the loop and finish initial loop automatically. As I said before, these are selections that only come up when you have this at the very beginning. If I have it here, 
and we just go on recording, it just says, well, what's the loop length? So obviously it's one bar. If I say it's four bars, it's gonna make that bigger. Now the sequencer has a couple of icons in the bottom right-hand corner, and the first one is timeline looping. When you turn timeline looping on, what you can do is you can actually use the bars at the top here, and you can say how far along you want to loop for. So maybe we only want to loop in this section. So you drag the start and end points to where you want them to be, and then during playback on the sequencer, when it goes into this section, it will then continuously loop in this section. So we've got it from bar 21 to bar 37 or the end of 36. And it will just carry on looping around that region. So very, very quickly, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna bring this back to the very beginning. Let's just go for four bars. Let's just drag the playhead right to the beginning and let's just press play. Now you can see a brand new icon, which is play, but with the circle. And it's just gonna go from bar one to four. When you press this other button that's next door to the sequencer, it will jump out and continue. And it'll carry on for the rest of the sequence. With timeline looping, it means that you can concentrate on a certain section. Maybe you're working on the verse. You need to make sure it sounds right. You're moving things around. Then you can move on to the chorus and use this to define the sections really well. But you can combine timeline looping in combination with sequence recording to record something over several cycles. And this is a really powerful way to figure out a section of a song. Maybe you need to add something to it. So whilst the timeline's going around, you can continue to add loops and go, right, that's part of that section. To turn timeline looping off, we just tap the icon that's the bottom right-hand corner of the circle with the two arrows. It will go dark and you can see the timeline region actually goes gray. The other icon is the dotted square. And when you have this active, it means you can select a lot of things at once. So we can actually pinch here. Let's go back up to our timeline and let's just select this entire section. So you can see here, we've highlighted it. There's a white line around all the loops and I could move that entire section if I needed to. And once you've made a selection, the dotted square actually goes black because it's made its selection already. To get out of that, all we do is we just tap anywhere else where there isn't a loop and it will deselect the lot. Now the final part of this, which is really cool, is if you want to then export all of this out as more than just a stereo mix, and that's a share button. So the share button on the sequencer has these options. We can have a stereo mix, or we can have a multi-track mix. If we select multi-track, you can now see it's figuring this out, and it's asking me where I want to put it. It creates a folder, and inside that folder is all the tracks in sequence for you to just drop into maybe another digital audio workstation in the quality that you set. So I've got this in 32 bit, 48 kilohertz, ready to play somewhere else. Stereo mix is exactly the same, except it's one stereo mix left and right, one piece of audio, and it's not in a folder. Be aware that when you do this, it will set the folder or the audio name as the name of the session. So this is called JP's set two. So it's actually called the folder JP's set two. So if you've actually got the name of the song and you've created a template that's a different name, you might want to rename that template to the name of the song. Remember, once you've played around with the sequence, you've got it the way you want, you can still record the audio of a combined input and output. The beauty of this is that you've got the loops the way you want to. Maybe you're recording at home, you're not performing it to a live audience and you want to get this down but you also want to sing and play over the top of it. So you could have individual audio inputs, you could have individual color groups, we could have individual buses, and we can turn all of these on. So just for an example, I've selected them all, and then I'm gonna go back and I hit start recording. One, two, one, two. But if you need to see all the different recordings, it's actually saved it inside Loopy Pro in the file management system. So let's go to files. We're gonna find Loopy Pro, which is just here. And you can see the sets, which are your loops and your settings for that session. But you can see the individual folders that we've made today. The first one was just the combined input and output, which was this one here. And you can see it's one WAV of a combined input and output of what we recorded. However, the next one, we told it to actually set everything. So we've got a second folder here, again called JP Set 2 if we go into it, you can see all the different options you've got. We've got the audio source, the channel one, which is my microphone. You've got the audio source for House Mark 1, 
combined input, combined output, both combined input and output, then you've got all of the different color groups because we asked it to do that. This is massively powerful because I could just take this, put it into a digital audio workstation or send it to someone else to mix and master later on. What I'd highly recommend is going into the session is to change the name of the session so you know what it's gonna be when you get back to here and you can export this out wherever you need it to go. So these first 10 videos have been getting you up and running with Loopy Pro as fast as possible. We went over the overview, the user interface and how it works. We went over the clock and the gestures, how to control the bars and all the swiping and tapping that you need. We went over gear, audio units, controllers, and even MIDI gear that you might need to put into Loopy Pro. We went over the mixers and the colors, the effects and the plugins. We went over templates and grouping to help you build your own version of Loopy Pro how you want it to be, the settings menu and the things inside there, some amazing advanced recording techniques, including retrospective recording, having an intro and a tail, the last video, which was MIDI and everything to do with MIDI, and then this video about recording the sequence of your loops and then finally getting it out to make a song, whether that's going into a digital audio workstation or you're recording the output as a stereo mix. I hope these 10 videos have helped you. And in the next few videos, we're gonna be going over some very specific things that Loopy Pro can do and how to overcome a couple of hurdles.